when you look at people's behavior, for the most part, uh, what you see is the way people appear to relate to life as, as, as though life is a threat. Uh, so there's a lot of avoidance and protective defensive behaviors and uh, aggressive behaviors and strategies and all those kinds of things, uh, rather than uh, facing the challenge of living a life that's effective. Uh, which is a commitment and a choice. And if you make that commitment and a choice, like life is an opportunity and life is precious and valuable, uh, then you're willing to uh, participate in life in a way that gets the results that you want. So I think the same thing is true here. We talked about the fact that this is going to be a 90-minute uh, presentation and that uh, the, the rules of participating in this are a little different than uh, just any conversation in the sense that in just any conversation, uh, people feel that the way to be in the conversation is to continually uh, interpret what's being said and decide whether you agree with it and then present your opinion when the opportunity arises and so forth. And the difference between that and this is that the intention here is to present something that's useful and powerful to people, give some examples of uh, how it, that's the case, uh, and then give people the opportunity to ask any questions they may have in order to clarify uh, that they're getting uh, the material that we're presenting, that they're getting uh, what we intend for people to get so that they can uh, take it back to life and hopefully download the material from the course and start to look at it and then uh, try it on in, in action, uh, to apply it to life and see if it's not the case that it actually produces the uh, results. Until something is distinguished, it doesn't show up. You don't notice it. Uh, so by distinguishing these things, you start paying attention to these things, and then you start noticing how they interfere with your effectiveness. It's kind of interesting to me that this is not something that a lot of people would choose to engage with because it's not an opportunity uh, to have a, an ordinary conversation, you know, where you get to present your opinions and you get to judge and evaluate what's going on. It's different in the sense that uh, you can't really know what this is about until you get clear about the technology and then apply it to see how it works. So there's no point in, you know, judging and evaluating it or comparing it to anything else uh, during the conversation or during the presentation. Mm -hmm. Tara can ask questions, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, for me personally, it's quite a relief to not have to agree or disagree. I, I think <laughs> for me, that's what, that's what pulls me into this more. <laughs> I have no opinions. So. <laughs> well, that's smart, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, in life, normally, uh, that's the way people participate. And uh, it's smart to be willing to just get what somebody's presenting and then give yourself the opportunity to test it out in life, especially if they're claiming that it's got power and it'll make a big difference in your life. Well, for me, it's so different, you know, it's just so different to figure out like I could just listen and that's okay, you know, I don't really have to be the talker. <laughs> <laughs> which I don't know, maybe today you will find me doing that because I'm always talking, right? But I mean, just the whole idea is already a breakthrough. Like, oh, well, I don't have to object to this guy and I can honor what he says and, you know, I can respect him for the way he re leads his life. And probably, you know, billions of people li live uh, billions of different lives and why not? And for me, it's being willing to listen to something different that I probably would normally listen to. And, and I discovered that uh, this really enables me to hear just a lot more. I'm just open to, to listening. For the first time in a long time, I feel like I'm on the right track because I'm doing what I love and I'm like following my, my talents. Um, like instead of like trying to do what I thought society or my parents wanted me to do. Um, and what's not working, which is kind of hard, is um, having my voice heard, which is funny that 
<laughs> We're not supposed to talk. <laughs> well, I think you can talk if you want to. You just do it. For the most part, what we're doing here will be seen by m most people after the case, you know, after uh, we're done here and it's a recording. Uh, so uh, I'm also talking to those people and saying to those people that if you have questions uh, and you need to get clear about something that you're not clear about, you can always email me afterward and I'll be happy to answer the question in response to your email questions. Uh, so that's, that's another option. Uh, the course is about leadership and about being a leader, actually being a leader, not learning about leadership, but uh, a technology that allows you to actually be a leader and, uh, and learn about you know, what it is to be a leader in terms of the experience of being a leader. Uh, and one of the things that's stated in the very beginning of the course is that being a leader starts with being the leader of your own life. The course is designed to uh, have people uh, be a leader in the world. You know, it's designed to produce leadership in the world that's effective. Um, but what I'm talking about here is the fact that the material in the course is just as powerful in terms of be, being a leader in your own life, leading your own life. And it's, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer that if you can't lead your own life, you're probably not going to be an effective leader in the world. You're going to be preoccupied with, with your life because if your life isn't working, that's going to be taking your attention. Um, so having said that, uh, what occurred to me to be the case is that a place to start for yourself in examining your own life in terms of uh, leadership is to look at the question for yourself, are you leading your life? Uh, and, you know, when we present these questions, when I present these questions, uh, it really requires that you be brutally honest about it. You know, most people want to present well. I mean, most people want to look good. That's one of the things that gets in the way of being authentic. Uh, so when you look at these questions, if unless you're brutally honest and you don't have to uh, share the answer to the question with the public, but unless you're br brutally honest, um, then you're not going to get any value at all from the process of looking. So in, the, in terms of the question, are you leading your own life? Um, if the life it, it is the life you have, the life you want is a way of looking uh, to see what the answer to that question is. Is the life you have the life you want? Uh, is everything in your life and the areas of life that are important to you working? Uh, are your relationships working? Are your important emotional relationships working? Is the relationship you have with yourself working? Are you producing the results in life that you want to produce in terms of your career or your job? Uh, are you producing the results in your life in terms of uh, enjoying life, the quality of your life? That's, that's, that, that, those are the places that you want to look for yourself. Now, I assert, I'm, I'm asserting this, uh, that uh, if you're brutally honest, that... Um, 99.9% .9 of people uh, will see that there are areas in their life that aren't working as well as they could work, aren't working the way they want them to work. Um, and so uh, that question is really a setup. Uh, if you really answer the question honestly, you're going to come back with some areas in your life that uh, you're not leading your life effectively in. So are you effective in life? That is, do you get the results you intend from the actions you produce in your speaking and behaviors? That's what effectiveness, what I mean by effectiveness. Are you getting the results that you want from the, uh, the actions that you take and the way that you communicate? Those are the two things in life. Those are actually the two areas of life that produce results. Uh, the behavior, your actions, your physical actions, and your speaking are the, the only two things you have uh, to produce results in life. Uh, so is what you're saying in life, the way you're communicating, whether we're talking about the way you communicate to yourself in your mind, 
the way you communicate to the people around you that are important that you love, the way you communicate to people that you're doing business with in life, you know, the way you communicate with everyone is, uh, is that and the actual behaviors that you're producing getting you the results that you want in your life. Um, so, are you effective in life? That is, do you get the results you intend from the actions you produce in your speaking and your behaviors? Uh, and what does the evidence say regarding this in your relationships and your work and the quality of your life and your experience of living? So, in other words, when I say what does the evidence say, what I'm inferring by saying that is that you're not you're not necessarily the right person to ask about you right because people are usually not necessarily straight about themselves uh, one of the ways that I determine whether somebody's living an effective life is to ask their partner uh, their partner will be more honest than they are usually about whether they're living an effective life so um, one of the things that one of the teachers that I have worked with in the past uh, typically does, if he wants to know how effective you are in living your life and you're married, he asks your wife. And uh, if she says that you're uh, living your life effectively and she's happy and your relationship is working, that's a good uh, piece of evidence. So what does the evidence say? And when I mean by what, what I mean by what does the evidence say, I mean, uh, if we did an, a, an assessment of your life in terms of uh, what you say you want from life, what you say you want the quality of your life to be, what you say you want the results to be, does the evidence in your life reflect that, that you're producing that result for yourself? So that's something that, again, if you're brutally honest about it, you'll find that there are areas in your life where the evidence says that uh, what you're saying and what you're doing is not producing the results that you want. And so it becomes a matter of how effective you are in living your life. Okay, can you move that down, Richard, to the next? Uh... When the results you get don't match your intentions, what accounts for the difference? That's a... Uh, uh, an important question you know if you're not getting the results that you want in your life what's happening that is causing that to be the case see when the results you don't uh, what you get don't match what you want they don't match your intentions what's going on why is that the case what accounts for the difference so that's an important question and it's a question that can only be answered if you start to really pay attention to your experience, what's going on in your head in terms of your thought process, you know, what's going on in terms of the way that you're perceiving life. One of the things that the uh, creators of this course talks about in the course is that uh, the source of human behavior most people think that the source of human behavior is their past experiences. Uh, and one of the things that this person uh, says is that the actual source of human behavior, when you study brain science, uh, the actual source of human behavior is the, the way things occur to you. So the way things occur to you is the way that you behave, that you behave in a dance in relationship to the way things show up for you, the way things occur for you, the way life shows up for you, the way situations show up for you. So I worked in prisons for 32 years with a lot of people uh, who did things that produced negative consequences like being locked up for a long time and being isolated. And one of the things that uh, they discovered when they did some of this work was that the reason they did what they did that got them arrested and put in prison was because the way things occurred for them, had it appeared to them uh, that they needed to do what they did. So uh, that's a place that you want to pay attention in terms of, you know, how do things occur for you? And it's also important to recognize that 
Um, most people think that the way things show up for them, the way things occur for them, the way they perceive things uh, is uh, the way things actually are. And that's not the case. And the evidence for that is pretty obvious. All you have to do is uh, ask different people uh, how they perceive things, what their point of view is, and you see that their pu uh, uh, people's point of view is very different from one person to the next. So obviously what you're perceiving is, is not the truth, it's just your point of view. And if what you're perceiving is just your point of view, it means that all other points of view aren't available to you, that you're only seeing things one way out of a, a, a huge number of ways of seeing things. And so you don't have much information to work with in order to be effective. So that's one of the things that you start to notice if you start paying attention to the fact that the way that you operate is that you typically consider, as is the case with most human beings, you typically consider that, the way, that what you're perceiving is the way things actually are. If you start to pay attention and you start to examine this, you find out that's not the case. And if that's not the case, it starts to make it obvious why you may not be getting the results that you want in life, because you're not seeing things the way they actually are. You're seeing them from a distorted point of view. And then if you behave in relationship to the point of view that you have, and your point of view is distorted, then obviously you're not necessarily going to get results. The results you get are probably more a function of accident than they are of your intentions. So are you free to produce the actions that will produce the results you want in life? So what that talks about is that there is always an action that you can take that will produce the result that you intend in life. The question is, are you free to see what that action is? And are you free to produce that action? And what the evidence begins to demonstrate, if, if you pay attention, uh, to what's actually going on in your life is that you're not free. You're not free to see things in a way that allows you to see what you could do that would work. And you're not free to behave in the ways that you would need to behave to get the results that you want. You're limited or you're constrained in terms of how you see things uh, so that you see things in a, a very limited way and your behaviors are constrained uh, by your personality and uh, by your reactions. And we'll talk about that a little more as we go on. Uh, tell me if you have any questions about what's being said so far that will allow you to be clear about what I'm talking about. I don't have any questions. Okay, so are you getting what I'm talking about? Yes. All right, good. All right, so I'll thought. say one thing, you know, that one question at the top of the page that says, uh, are you getting the results that you're, you're, you're intending to get and, and why, what's the difference, you know, what, what causes that difference? Like that's a fundamental question of life for, for everybody's full lifetime. Like that's the, the core of the course. I don't know. That is, that is the hugest question. <laughs> why don't you get the results you want? Well, you know, you know, you're absolutely right, Richard, but you know, the thing that's interesting is that most people don't ask that question. They're too busy justifying the results that they didn't get. <laughs> yeah, right. You know? That's why they don't see it. That's probably what the main thing is, because we're justifying the results we didn't get. And that's the that's main right. probably reason why we're not getting what we want. The that's justification right. is like a, like a total stopper. That's right. If, you, if you're winning in life, you don't need explanations and justifications. You're a winner. It's losers that spend a lot of time explaining themselves. <laughs> I found that to be the case when I work with people in prison, that, you know, that the guys in prison are very eager to explain themselves. <laughs> to justify. They're really good justifiers. Huh? <laughs> That's right. And, you know, and one of the things that they typically would say is that, you know, it's not fair. <laughs> Life isn't fair, you know. It's not an even playing field. That's why I did what I did. Uh, well, you know, if you if you if you're not clear that life isn't fair, uh, you, you know, you haven't even begun to be effective. You know, life isn't interested in fairness. Life is life. Life goes the way it goes. 
So, uh, could you put the document back? Are you free to produce the actions that will produce the results you want in life? So I already asserted that uh, the answer to that question is no. If you were free to produce the actions that would produce what you wanted in life, you would have the results right now. So obviously, if you don't have the results, then something's limiting you in terms of your ability to do what it would take to get the results that you want. And then the question that comes after that is, okay, so what is determining your actions? That is what you say and do when the outcomes or results are not what you intend. What's going on? What's happening that's having you do things that don't work? That's an important question. And again, most people don't ask that question. I'm a psychologist and people come to me and pay me a lot of money so that I can tell them to ask themselves that question. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. So if you, if you scroll down, Richard, yeah. Okay, so if if what is determining your actions, what you, you know, and your actions, again, are limited to two things in life. The only two things that we can do in life to produce results are uh, what we say and our behavior, our, our actual physical behavior. They're the two things that we do in life. Um, a good place to look to see this is in your most intimate relationships where you experience being the most at stake. So if you, if you want to see how effective you are in life, uh, a good place to look is in your most intimate relationships, because if you're ineffective, that's where it's going to probably show up the most. Um, and that's what I've made a good living, uh, helping people to realize. <laughs> So that's a good place to look. And again, you'd have to, you have to be brutally honest about it. You know, uh, one of the things that I found to be the case about relationship is people for the most part live in a state of denial. And what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, we all know that the percentage of marriages that end up in divorce is above 50%. My experience in working for 40 years with people uh, and couples and uh, in reference to relationship is that the difference between that above 50% divorce rate and the relationships that are actually fulfilling and satisfying and working is about another 40%. Uh, so what I'm saying is that for, uh, most people are in denial about their relationship working because it would make them look bad to admit that it isn't. And then if it isn't, it's either them or the other person. And usually it's the other person when you listen to people talk about it. Uh, but the reality of it is, my experience has been, if that's, and I think my experience is, uh, is accurate after 40 years, uh, that probably around 90 or more percent of people in relationships uh, are in relationships that aren't really working uh, the way they want them to work, not really producing the satisfaction that they want in the relationship. Uh, not the f producing the fulfillment that they want in the relationship. And, uh, and so they're living with the difference. So that's what tends to happen in relationship is it starts out with people being in love, which is a state of insanity. And then after that passes, uh, they start coping with the relationship and coping with the other person. And they have a story about the other person uh, in terms of what's wrong with them and why the way they are is the reason that the relationship isn't working. So that's a good place to look to see if you're being effective because uh, one of the keys of being effective in an intimate relationship is, is your willingness to be 100% responsible for uh, the workability of the relationship. If you're 100% responsible for having the relationship work, it means that you don't get to blame the other person for anything. And then you get to see uh, for yourself who you could be to have the relationship work. Okay, so uh, when who you're being and what you are saying or doing doesn't work, what is operating that interferes with the intended outcome? So let me say that again. When who you're being and what you're saying or doing doesn't work, what is operating that is interfering with the intended outcome? 
So again, if you look in uh, relationships as an example of that, if in your relationship, what you're saying or what you're doing doesn't work, in other words, you end up in conflict with your partner, uh, you end up in upset with your partner, you end up being disappointed with your partner, you end up angry with your partner, you end up blaming them or blaming yourself. Uh, that's a condition in a relationship. Uh, and if that's going on, then the question is, what's happening that's interfering with your ability to see who to be, what to say, and what to do in the relationship to have the relationship work, to have it be what you want it to be. So effective leadership involves being able to see what works in any given situation and being free to say or do whatever will work to produce the intended results. So effective leadership involves being able to see what works in any given situation and being free to say or do whatever will work to produce the intended results. That's very important, you know, to really let that sink in, that that's what effective leadership is. And I'll give you an example of that. A quarterback on a football team, one of the things a quarterback on a professional football team gets trained to do is be an effective leader. The quarterback is the leader of the team. And so the quarterback needs to be trained to be able to see what will work in any given situation so that when they uh, call a play and the quarterback calls a play and goes out on the field with the team, they have a play, a strategy that they're going to act out. But often what happens is when the play begins, the play gets broken up by the defensive team. So they can't carry that out. The uh, quarterback may have planned to pass the ball to one or two intended receivers, but they get covered. So the quarterback then has to be able to see what will work in that situation when the situation changed unex uh, uh, unexpectedly and then be free to do or say whatever will work to produce the intended results. And that has to happen in a matter of seconds for a quarterback. They have to be able to look down the field and see opportunities for action in order to uh, make the play work and move the ball down the field. So that's a good example of what I mean by being able to see what works in any given situation. And so that's one of the jobs that the coach has is to train the quarterback to be able to not, and with, uh, as we get further into this, or as you get further into this, you'll see that what would interfere with the quarterback being effective, one of the things that would interfere with the quarterback being effective is that he has thoughts occurring in his mind that he pays attention to, or he has feelings of fear that he pays attention to that distract his attention from the field. That's pretty clear when you consider it, right? And if you're not paying attention to what's going on in the world around you, obviously you're not going to be very effective in doing what it takes to produce the results that you want. So are there constraints that limit what you can see, perceptual constraints, and are there constraints that limit what you can do, functional constraints, that may be unseen, yet account for the difference between the outcomes you intend and the outcomes that occur in your life? So when we talk about constraints here, what we're talking about is, is that which is limiting your ability to behave in a way that produces the results you want? What's limiting your ability to behave in a way that produces the results that you want. And there are two types of constraints that are constraining you or limiting you that are talked about in the course. One is perceptual constraints, the other is functional constraints. And these constraints typically are unseen. In other words, you're not aware of these, what's going on that's limiting you. And so one of the things that you learn out of this course is to pay attention to areas of your experience that you weren't paying attention to that uh, allow you to see what's happening that's getting in your way of 
performing effectively, what's getting in your way of behaving effectively to produce the results that you want in life. So perceptual constraints are the beliefs, conclusions, the biases, the prejudices, uh, the conditioning that you have from your past experience, uh, any way of looking, any way of perceiving what's going on in the world around you that is limited by your previous experiences. An example of this is the idea of already or always already listening or already always listening is an example of a perceptual constraint. So listening is one of the ways we perceive what's going on in the world. And one of the uh, it, a perceptual constraint in terms of listening is the idea that people have an already always listening. So what is an already always listening? And already always listening means that you're listening to a conversation in your head rather than listening to another person. So what I mean by that is that right now, for example, if you're listening to me speak and you start to pay attention to the conversation going on in your head while you're listening to me speak, you'll notice that you are deciding whether you agree with me or you don't agree with me. You're deciding whether you like me or you don't like me. You're deciding whether you understand what I'm talking about or you don't. And if you don't, you're concluding that I'm confusing you or that what I'm saying doesn't make sense or that uh, I'm not getting to the point or that you're not interested in this. All of these things are going on in the conversation in your head that are being added to what I'm saying so that it changes what I'm saying into what's left after you evaluate it and judge it and add your own conclusions to it and add your own past experience to it in terms of whether you understand it or not. Uh, so, Richard, uh, do you have that, um, you said you had the slide for the already always listening? Yes, I'll put it on. Why don't you put it on and then go uh, uh, review it, you know, yourself, since you're f very familiar with that. I know that uh, this is one area that you have looked at for yourself and, and realized that it uh, is, in fact, what goes on. So why don't you go over that? Okay. Well, I mean, uh, I'm I'm right now. I'm on a list of uh, of a bunch of already always listenings. But maybe I'll back up and I'll give the I'll go back to one example in particular, and uh, I'll go a little more in depth in that one. And so then it says uh, uh, a person becomes or already always listening. Many people hear what is said to them with "I know." or I already know, or I know better, already in their listening, before they hear almost anything that's said to them. Now, this is the good part. It's not that the, what they are thinking I already know, like they, they consider the, the information coming at, at them and say, oh, yeah, let me see, yeah, I already know that. It's not that they, can, they are thinking I already know. Who they are is I already know. It's kind of like a knee-jerk or automatic reaction, right? It's not really... Uh, in the nerves like a knee-jerk reaction would be, so that's not exactly a right metaphor, but they, uh, uh, it's just so automatic that uh, the consequences of such an all, already always listening are easy to imagine. The consequences are the same as if you said to someone who's about to say something to you, I already know, but uh, now what did you want to say to me? Or I even know better. Now what do you want to say to me? With such a listening, it's difficult for you to hear anything that might be new for you. Or if what is said, in fact, enhances what you know, it's unlikely that it will register for you as a contribution. Rather, with an I know already always listening, even a contribution is likely to land for you as a criticism. So that's just one of them. And then I'll just go ahead and, and look at a list of a bunch of them and so that people can uh, kind of recognize things that, okay. Identify your always, already always listening. Okay, what is the already always listening that you are? See if you can find yourself in any of the following. Do I agree, agree or do I disagree with what's being said? Is it right or is it wrong? Is it true or is it false? And, and so then if I don't agree, then I don't listen. Another one is it's not my fault. I'm not to blame. I'm not responsible. 
and this might be especially at work uh, if people are always scapegoating or trying to find out who did what right and you say and keep your skirts clean you know it's not my fault the one we mentioned i know i already know i know better another one i'm right and i'm not wrong Here's one for the boss, you know, I'm the leader, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, do what I say. And whatever somebody's bringing to them, they'll say, are you doing what I say, you know? That's why they hear. You should, you're supposed to. That could be in a, in a big company also where people uh, think, uh, listen, you're not going to make it around here until you find out how things are done. You're supposed to do it this way. I'm busy. What do you want out of me? What's your point? Get to the point, you know? People are, people are proud of their business, and that just keeps them more and more busy. Uh, you know, am I going to like or dislike what's being said? Is it going to make me look good, or is it going to make me look bad? These are all skeptical, you know, how we are skeptical, and we say, well, we've been through a lot of tr trials and troubles, and uh, we're skeptical about uh, what people's motivations are. What's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? Is this going to be a waste of my time? Do I believe in what's being said? Uh, why are you really saying what, uh, what you are saying? What do you really mean? Uh, that's a real deep skepticism, like someone's always trying to jigger me. Someone's trying to always manipulate me. What is the bottom of this? Let's get to the bottom of what they're saying. Are you going to hurt me? Take advantage of me. Tell me the truth. What are you really up to? There's so many of these already always listings that are, are skeptical. You're not going to tell me what to do, are you? Like, don't boss me around. Is this... Somebody trying to boss me around, I don't accept that. Or here's the, the, the absolute opposite. Tell me what to do. What's the answer? I don't know. What, I never know what to do. Please. <laughs> so these are some of the, uh, we can certainly all uh, identify with, uh, with a lot of these and maybe all of them. But uh, The thing about this that's, uh, that's, that's, that's critical is that, you know, uh, Many times people will uh, uh, look at what you just presented, and even when they're looking at what you just presented about the fact that there's an already always listening, they'll be listening to what you're saying about the already always listening with an already always listening. So they'll be in denial about it. You see, the thing is, it takes courage. It takes being really brutally honest with yourself to start to pay attention to the conversation you're having in your head rather than listening to what somebody else is saying. Uh, so people will tend to uh, not want to really look at it and uh, be look, looking at what you're talking about and what you're saying. Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, a lot of times when people are talking about things like this, uh, in terms of what pe people typically do that doesn't work, they'll talk about it and they'll say, of course, I'm not referring to you, uh, which is a way of uh, letting the person know that I am referring to you, but uh, you're probably in denial about it, so I won't say that I'm referring to you. Um, another thing with the already always listening that I've seen to be the case, especially in working with couples in therapy, and I can actually see this in action, uh, when you ask the couple to communicate and then you uh, observe their communication, it's very obvious that one person is uh, saying to the other person uh, something and the other person's listening is, you're a jerk, now what do you have to say? Uh, and you can tell that they have that already always listening because after the person says what they have to say, what the person that was listening says back is what you would say to somebody you consider to be a jerk. <laughs> people are really a trip it's really a, an incredible career to get paid to <laughs> but to be with people and participate with them in the and the, the the insane way that they behave in their life <laughs> especially so in a when, way all yeah. this kind of work you know is uh, all we're trying to do is catch ourselves in the act right and somehow you know no matter what the other it's so easy to catch the other one in the act but who cares you know really it, you know we're not here to clear everyone else out, but to really uh, get it, get it that we're here to catch ourselves in the act, I think is a, a great jump. Well, leadership, you know, leadership involves your willingness to be responsible for who you're being that produces the results, not who, what other people are doing. 
That's what leadership is. So if you're going to lead your life, then the way that you look at your life is that I'm the source of my results. If you're going to lead your life, that's the way you look at your life so you can see what your results are and you can start to pay attention to what's interfering with your ability to produce the results that you want. Now, what people typically do is not that. You know, what they do if they don't produce the results that they want is they talk about the circumstances that they've got. That explains my results. You know, yeah, I, I saw in the course when they said, uh, uh, in, the, instead of results, they give you reasons, right? <laughs> That's right. Instead of results, they give you reasons. And, and the biggest reason that people give is their circumstances. Uh, I had a fellow give me a call this morning uh, who I worked with when he was in prison, and he's out now. And he called me to tell me that he uh, doesn't have any money. He, he's going to lose where he's living. He's got to find a place to live. Uh, and he can't, uh, he can't uh, get a job, and he doesn't know what he's going to do. And so uh, I said, well, you know, what, what's the circumstances? And he said, well, there's, there's just no jobs out there. And I said, well, if those are the circumstances and that explains the results that you're getting, what's the problem? You know, I mean, you're telling me there's no jobs out there. So why would you expect that you would get a job? So he, you know, I really was redirecting his attention to the way that he was constraining his own perception of things. And then the way he was seeing things resulted in, the re in him not being able to get the results that he wanted to get. So functional constraints. So now we're going to move on to functional constraints. Functional constraints are automatic, like knee-jerk reactions. And they're often fueled by intense emotions, such as anger. Functional constraints uh, really, uh, as far as I can tell, are probably the biggest area of interference in terms of your ability to see things clearly and produce the behavior that's going to get the results that you want. Um, and you can see this very clearly when you watch people interact with each other, that they react to one another and it's automatic. And especially if uh, a person is angry, you can see in your own life, again, if you look in your closest intimate relationships, when your relationships don't work, it's probably when you're angry and you say and do things uh, that cause negative consequences. And when you see that happening between people and they go back and forth with each other, so they react back and forth to each other, it's called an argument, okay? And it usually gets heated and it gets to a, a place where they have to stop talking because it's evident that if they continue to talk the way they're talking and the conflict continues to expand, that there won't be any basis to be related anymore. So functional constraints are automatic. They're knee-jerk reactions, and they're often fueled by intense emotions such as anger. So what you want to do in terms of perceptual constraints and functional constraints is to look in your own life and notice that uh, you have these constraints and that these constraints interfere with your ability to act in your own best interest. They interfere with your ability to produce the results that you want. Uh, and just by being aware of that and then consciously paying attention uh, to your reactions, it becomes possible to intervene in such a way that your reactions don't uh, run the show uh, and you discover new possibilities for producing the results that you want. So whatever is undistinguished in our experience is that which we have no ability to deal with or manage whatever is undistinguished. So when I say that, what I mean is that if I talk about functional constraints, or I talk about perceptual constraints, those are now distinctions. I'm distinguishing these things. So if they're distinct now for you, they are things that you can now pay attention to because they will show up for you where they didn't show up before. So that's what a distinction is. It's uh, some specific piece of information that makes it possible for you to be attending to that information in a way that you can manage it. 
I'll, let me give you an example of what distinctions are all about. I'm a psychologist, and as a psychologist, due to my training and experience, I have distinctions about human behavior that most people don't have. So I can sit down with somebody and have a conversation with them, and I will see things going on with them in terms of what they're saying and how they're behaving that most people wouldn't notice because they don't have the distinctions that I have about it. Power is having a life that is satisfying and fulfilling. It's satisfying and fulfilling because you're producing the results that you want. This is an interesting uh, thing to me because, you know, uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that uh, most people, when it comes to having a life that's satisfying and fulfilling, uh, they get involved in spiritual teachings or they get involved in philosophical ideas and so forth, uh, as if that's the source of uh, what will allow you to experience satisfaction and fulfillment. The reality of it is, as far as I can tell, uh, that what actually produces satisfaction and fulfillment is how effective you are in life. If you're producing the results that you want, if your life is the life that you intend it to be, then you're going to experience satisfaction and fulfillment. And that's really uh, what people are after in life, is an experience of life that's satisfying and fulfilling. So distinctions are really an important uh, piece of the action when it comes to being effective. If you can't listen and hear what someone else is saying without the distortion, uh, then what you're getting is not what they're saying. You're getting something different than that, and that's what results in conflict and misunderstandings between people. So therefore, the more distinctions one has in life in terms of what works, what is happening uh, in reference to oneself, the more power one has. And by power, I mean the ability to produce the results that you intend. Another way of saying that is your ability to have a life that is satisfying and fulfilling. For example, perceptual and functional constraints are distinctions that provide access to that which limits our effectiveness. I think that's close to the end of that uh, uh, outline. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. One of the things that al allows you to be effective as a leader is to be undaunted. And what I mean by that is to be prepared to accept readily accept whatever's going on, uh, especially when it doesn't match your intentions, especially when it doesn't fit your expectations. If you can accept what's going on immediately when it's not fitting your expectations or matching your intentions, then you can be with it in a way where it doesn't affect your ability uh, to produce the results. Does, does that make, is that, am I clear with that? Context, literally, the context in which you perceive the content of what's going on literally determines what you see. The context literally determines what you see. And as I said before, what you see, what's occurring for you, the way the world's occurring for you is what you're in a dance with to produce your actions. So the context uh, determines what you see. In the situation we're in right now, for example, with the birds flying through and uh, all the other sound effects going on, I can either perceive this in the context in a context of that it's an upset, in which case it's going to interfere with uh, my ability to continue to be intentional and produce the results uh, of this presentation. Or I can have a context in which whatever happens uh, is acceptable. Whatever happens works. Whatever happens is an opportunity uh, to be intentional and to continue uh, to produce the behaviors and uh, express what I'm intending to communicate here so that people can get the value and the benefit from it. It's a beautiful uh, thing because, like, uh, we're talking about y your ability to listen, your ability not to be 
in some kind of a uh, always already listening. And if something comes unexpected, we slam right into our mind and say, that's not what I want, you know, and I, I'm not talking about David or I'm not talking about anyone. I'm talking about all of us. You know, this is a, a perfect example of a, uh, of uh, uh, something unexpected uh, really takes us away from uh, what's here and now. And, uh, and the example of leadership, but also the example of leading your own life is like how you can be present and how you can make everything an opportunity instead of an interruption or, or an obstacle. And uh, you can meet, you know, and we talk like that in spiritual talk, you know, about meeting what's here and what's coming. And so bring it on. Let's let it come, right? <laughs> well, the only the only thing is that you know that's talk. The 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 thing the problem the, the the problem I have with spiritual talk is that that's uh, what it amounts to talk. You know that uh, what we're dealing with here is how you translate what we're talking about into action. Uh, that's that's where the results come in. You know, if you can translate what we're talking about into action, it means that you take what I'm talking about and you discover it for yourself in your own experience. And when you discover it for yourself in your own experience, it then becomes something that you can utilize as you live your life in order to produce results. So context, you just gave an example of context, Richard, that uh, if, you, if you were to hold what's been going on in, in this meeting uh, in the context of that it's an upset, and the way I define upset is that whenever uh, your expectations are being un are unfulfilled, it's upsetting. Uh, so if you have the context that when things happen that are unexpected or unwanted, that it's an upset, then it's going to distract you and it's going to interfere with your ability to function. But if you have the context that anything goes, that you're willing to allow anything to happen that happens and include it in what's going on in a way that doesn't interfere with having it work, uh, then that context allows you uh, to relate to what's going on in a way that it doesn't interfere with or affect your ability to produce results. Does that, is that coming across clear? Another example of context is that um, if you're driving in a car, and uh, for most people these days, when we're driving a car in traffic, uh, most people experience everybody in front of them to be in their way. That's kind of the context of driving in traffic these days. Uh, and if the person in front of you is driving below the speed limit and keeping you from getting where you got to go and making you late for an appointment, you start to have uh, upsets and reactions and negative thoughts about that person. And in some cases, worse than that. You know, people beep their horn, uh, give the finger, you know, and uh, shout out negative things. Um, but an example of what I mean by context is if you discovered that that person in front of you uh, was an elderly woman who actually was your grandmother, uh, it would shift the whole way you were experiencing what was going on. And you would no, no longer uh, have the same reaction that you would have if you experienced the person in front of you to be a jerk that's in your way. So that's an example of context. It's very, very powerful because what you discover uh, when you get into the material that's in this course is that uh, if, you have, if you have contexts in your life that you're unaware of that are causing uh, the way that you experience things and the way that you perceive things, they're not actually contexts, they're conditions, like the weather. You know, you don't have any say-so about them because you're not even aware they exist. So when you become aware of context, one of the things you discover is your ability to create a context. Rather than, uh, you know, the symbol in Chinese uh, for crisis is the exact same symbol that uh, means opportunity. The same symbol represents crisis and opportunity. Uh, so that's an example of context that you can create. Uh, you can look at any situation you find yourself in if once you discover the power of context and you create, you can create a context that has what's occurring uh, the situation you're in show up as an opportunity rather than uh, uh, an upset or a situation that you have no control over uh, that uh, causes you to uh, make conclusions about life, like life sucks and then you die. <laughs> So anyway, to start to move into a wrap-up here, I hope that 
the things that uh, I talked about, the questions that I presented in the outline are useful to people uh, in terms of you're looking for yourself to see what the uh, honest answers to those questions are. I hope that uh, the points that we brought up that are part of the course in terms of perceptual and functional constraints and context give people an idea of some of the material that's powerful in this course if you apply it in your life. And that's really where you get to see what this is all about. It's in the application of it. Uh, to just learn about this and then forget about it and not apply it in your life is going to have it uh, not show up as having any power at all. So it's in the application of this that uh, you discover the power of it. And again, my point in this presentation is to allow people to discover that there is a course out there that ha has been created by leading edge thinkers about how to be a leader, what the being of a leader is, uh, so that you can actually use the technology uh, to create the experience of leadership for yourself and have it be a, a, a natural way that you express yourself. Um, and this course is available in its totality online. Uh, it's very comprehensive. It takes six days to do 12 hours a day if you actually did it in person, which I did in June. Uh, so it really involves a commitment. And if you saw something in what was being said here in this meeting uh, that you saw as uh, having some potential or having some possibility to be useful to you, to allow you to get the results that you want in life, uh, then take that, what you saw, the inspiration that you got, and use it uh, to download the material for the course and start going through the slides. If you just go through the slides, you'll start to see uh, exactly what's uh, presented in the course. And then uh, what you need to do as you go through the slides is really consider uh, for yourself what's being presented and really uh, look for yourself in your own experience to see what's being talked about and then to apply it in your life and notice the difference it makes. So uh, that's what this has been all about. It's part of my uh, intention uh, to be a leader in terms of uh, having an impact, the greatest impact possible on the people that I come in contact with in life. And as I shared with you, Richard, in the past, the game that I'm playing in life at this point is to have an impact on humanity. And the reason that that's the case, and one of the points that's presented in the Course on Leadership is one of the elements of being a leader is to uh, have something greater than yourself that you're committed to. Uh, that takes uh, a leadership. and. That's the case even in terms of your personal life. You know, um, if you're committed to having a relationship that works, then your commitment is uh, to something uh, greater than yourself, like the relationship that you're having with the other person or the other person in their life. Uh, and you discover for yourself that to be effective in leading your life in terms of having a relationship work ends up uh, meaning that if you have the person you're in relationship to, if you have, have, have a commitment to have them win in life, if you have a commitment to have them be successful, uh, then you'll find out that the relationship works uh, without any problems instead of having attention on yourself and whether you're getting what you want all the time. So it's now 828, and uh, that's pretty much what I have to say. I hope that people go to your website and download the link so that they can look at the course material and test it out in life uh, and see the power that it provides for them. Do you have any uh, remarks that you want to make, Richard? Okay. Uh, it might sound like a big uh, uh, obstacle to really find something that's uh, greater than you. You know, you have never really thought of anything greater than you, but I would just say that if you're effective in your own life, then you're effective in the people's lives around you. And it's not only your mate, but whoever's around you, if you have children or if you're involved with a school system, or even if you're just doing shopping and, and of course you have a job or so then you are already uh, committed to something that's greater than you. So that is, that's already a, a fact, you know, and you can maybe expand that or, or see that in a, in a, in a, 
in a broader view. And uh, the course material is, uh, the link to it is there on that one post where I say there's 700 slides. And uh, again, that's not 700 pages, that's like 700 paragraphs. And uh, uh, you can check it out and go over it. What we intend to do is to uh, go deeply, deeper into different parts of this course. I mean, I read the 700 slides, but I want to get involved. I, I want to get involved not because I'm trying to uh, take the place of the originators of the course and try to give it uh, uh, or to be some kind of a know-it-all or anything. I want to absorb it more and just reading a book or reading 700 slides, maybe that's not enough. Maybe that's just my worry that I need uh, something more, uh, more involvement. And I want to really wear this on my skin and wear it in my uh, relationships and, and uh, know it every day. So that uh, both David and I, uh, we're intending like it's starting the end of September and maybe through October to have two or three, who knows if it really goes good, uh, go deep, deeper into this course. And again, we're never gonna teach the course uh, and we're not even proposing that you take it. Uh, we're just saying, uh, take a look at some different things, different aspects of your life and see what's operating there. So that's about what I wanted to say. And the other thing I would add to that, Richard, is that if you, if you're successful in leading your life, uh, you will automat you, you will naturally, uh, find something greater than yourself to be committed to because you'll be bored. <laughs>